Okay, um, welcome to the webinar uh, towards shop responsive social protection lessons from COVID-19 uh, response in six countries. My name is Rodolfo Beasley, and it is a pleasure uh, to be the moderator of today's uh, webinar. Uh, please feel free to say hello uh, through the chat box. Uh, you can tell us your name, organization, and anything else you may want to, to share. Um, we also encourage you to share your questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A option on the menu at the bottom. Um, if you wish to make any, any comments or share links uh, to useful resources, please use the, the chat box. Uh, so therefore, uh, for questions, the Q&A bottom and for comments and resources, the chat box. Uh, so today we are presenting the main findings of Maintain's research on the social protection responses to the COVID-19 crisis in Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Kenya, Pakistan, Sierra Leone, and Uganda. And we're gonna have a discussion uh, based on those, on those findings. Maintains is a, is a research program funded by UK Aid, FCDO, and is implemented by Oxford Policy Management, uh, OPM. There are available uh, individual uh, reports for each country case study, and the main findings are summarized in a synthesis report, which we are launching uh, today. And the links to the reports are, are gonna be shared uh, through the, the chat box. Um, so the agenda for, for, for today, uh, we'll start with a presentation, uh, with a presentation of the synthesis report by Alex Doyle and Jana Bishla from OPM. Uh, Alex led the country case studies in Kenya and Uganda, Yana the one in Ethiopia, and they both co-authored the synthesis report uh, jointly with, with me. Um, then we're gonna ask Anthony and Jesh and Valentina Barca to react to the presentation and give the, the feedback and thoughts. And Anthony leads the poverty, hunger and vulnerability team at FCDO in, in Kenya. And Valentina is an independent consultant currently leading the space facility. I'm sure that most of you are, are aware of it. Um, then uh, after the presentation and the reaction uh, from Valentina and, and Anthony, we'll move to the discussion. Um, based on the findings of the research, I'm gonna ask some questions to the discussants. And the idea is to have a debate about those findings and also to engage with evidence and, and experiences from, from elsewhere. We'll ask Madumita Heba to join the discussion with Valentina, Anthony, Alex, and Yana. Madumita is an independent consultant and she uh, led the Bangladesh case study for the maintenance research. And after that, uh, we'll answer your, your questions. I know that this sounds uh, long, but uh, I promise that it's going to be uh, exciting. So let's uh, get started uh, and let me ask um, Alex and Yana to give the presentation. Thanks. Great. Um, thank you so much, uh, Rodolfo. Um, so, um, yeah, thanks for the introduction and thanks everyone for um, for joining the, the webinar. So um, I want to start with giving a quick overview of, of, about the purpose of the, um, of the study um, and also um, a little bit about the methodology. So um, as uh, Rodolfo mentioned, towards the study is called Towards Shock Responsive Social Protection um, and it's a study by Maintains um, examining how social protection systems in the six Maintains countries have been adapted or expanded to respond to COVID-19. Um, and then secondly, the aim is also to then draw on the lessons from the social protection responses to COVID-19 in order to identify policy actions that will help to better prepare national prote social protection systems to respond to future shocks. Um, so as Rodolfo already mentioned, we produced several outputs as part of the study. Um, the first one being a conceptual framework that then guided the methodology and underpinned the, the remaining study um, and, and its outputs. 
Um, the conceptual framework um, guided um, our methodology around the types of, of responses. Um, it also um, uh, it provided um, a methodology behind policies, design features, operational procedures, um, underpinning the response. And finally, it, did, it set out the, the dimensions um, for an assessment of the outcomes of the response. Um, one point to mention, or two points actually, that we should um, flag um, about the methodology and the study is that, first of all, we mostly focused on um, analyzing the social assistance responses um, of the different countries. Um, but that being said, um, the country case studies um, for each of the countries are quite detailed and also list some of the other social protection responses, but they're not necessarily the focus of the analysis and we're mostly focusing on the social assistance responses. And then secondly, um, what we would like to flag is that the time frame um, for the analysis is it really focuses on the first year um, of the COVID-19 pandemic. So from March uh, 2020 to sort of the beginning of 2021 onwards. And um, while we are, of course, aware that, you know, since the beginning of 2020, several um, more things have happened in each of the th uh, six countries, more responses have been implemented as, as the uh, pandemic progressed um, and extended. Um, our analysis really goes up to the beginning of, of 2021. Um, so in terms of, um, so I would like to just start by giving a, a quick overview of, of um, how the different social protection systems responded to the pandemic. And in the interest of time, I won't sort of go into um, specific uh, responses and programs, but um, we'd really like to encourage everyone to have a look at the country case studies um, uh, that really describe all of those in a lot of detail. Um, but in general, the first category of responses that we that we looked at um, was around systems resilience measures um, and systems resilience measures really refer to tweaks to um, to routine operations to make sure that um, benefits can be delivered uh, in a timely and safe manner uh, throughout the shock. Um, so what we identified is that in, in almost all countries, um, governments, were, governments were quite quick to, to issue um, hygiene protocols and standard operating procedures that would allow for social distancing um, in, in the context of, of a continuation of, of um, routine uh, program operations. Um, we also found that in some countries, um, uh, uh, programs were um, were adapted to give lump sum payments to beneficiaries. So, meaning that se several payment cycles um, were lumped into into one payment cycle um, to one um, reduce the number of times that people would have to go to payment points and and expose themselves to physical contact, but also uh, to to help people um, adhere to social distancing uh, regulations, especially at the peak of lockdowns. Um, somewhat uniquely, uniquely um, among our six countries studied um, in Kenya, um, there was an integration of mobile of an option for more receiving benefits via mobile phones um, through the flagship program, the Inua Jami. And finally, um, in some countries such as Ethiopia, we also saw a suspension of uh, conditionalities as part of the main um, uh, social protection program there, the, the Productive Safety Net program, which meant, as many of you might know, is a public, um, a public works program. So for the remainder of the public works season of 2020, the public works conditionality was suspended in order to allow for a safe continuation of the program. Um, as a second category, um, countries have also um, expanded uh, their coverage um, in order to reach new people. Um, and somewhat interestingly, we found that um, in most of the six countries studied, um, governments actually opted to implement new time-bound programs in order to reach people rather than horizontally expanding existing programs. Um, the third category that we looked at was vertical expansions, um, which entails um, increasing the adequacy of benefits for existing program beneficiaries. And we found that in almost all um, of the six countries, except for Sierra Leone, um, some sort of vertical expansion was implemented, um, usually lasting, uh, bit, uh, uh, usually entailing top ups anywhere between three and six months. 
Um, and then finally, we also looked at uh, looked and documented humanitarian assistance um, measures, and especially those that piggyback um, onto existing um, onto the social protection system or align with the social protection system. Um, and what we found was that, especially in Kenya and Pakistan, a range of development partners um, complemented the government's response um, through cash-based um, interventions, time-bound cash-based interventions. And finally, in Ethiopia, um, that has a recurring humanitarian assistance pipeline, um, a limited number of people were supported with food assistance um, that were not covered by the, by the routine PSMP. Um, so looking at um, an assessment of the response and to trying to determine how well designed the responses were in mitigating the impact um, uh, that the pandemic had on poverty, we firstly um, looked at the dimension of coverage. Um, and um, what we found is that um, Pakistan and Bangladesh um, achieved quite um, impressive rates of coverage, um, but that there was quite a variation among countries with um, Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda and Sierra Leone achieving a much lower coverage of their um, main uh, social protection flagship response program. Um, in terms of adequacy, we found that, um, especially in the context of um, reduced fiscal space, um, all countries faced a trade-off, um, of course, between uh, coverage and adequacy, and most countries um, opted for um, spreading, um, spreading support more thinly uh, across a wider number of people. Um, what's also important to mention in, the, in, in with respect to cover uh, with, with respect to adequacy is that, um, as mentioned before, most responses were either one-off or time-bound transfers, which makes it highly likely that the adequacy um, uh, of transfer values will be insufficient, especially um, taking into consideration the prolonged um, the prolonged nature of this of this shock. Um, we had a look at comprehensiveness to see to what extent um, social assistance or social protection responses actually um, uh, went beyond providing subsistence support to address um, multiple risks. However, we found quite little um, and limited evidence um, for any systematic linkages um, of social protection responses to other social services in order to comprehensively address those risks. Um, so the assessment um, of, com uh, of coverage and adequacy, um, together with some micro simulations that we performed for three of the countries, um, helped us to um, analyze um, the, the mitigating effect that the, social, uh, that, that the main flagship social protection responses in the six countries had on um, mitigating some of the um, increase in, in poverty rates that we saw as a result of the pandemic. Um, so on the right, we can see the results from those micro simulations in, in three countries. Um, and what the black bar shows is basically the um, simulated increase in um, the percentage of the population living in poverty as a result of, of the shock of the pandemic. And then what the green bar simulates is, is the mitigating effect of the social protection response um, in or of the main flagship social protection response in those countries. So what we can see is that um, in all of the countries, the, the responses assessed were, were sort of not sufficient in order to, to offset um, the impact of the, um, of, the, of the shock significantly. Um, in Bangladesh and Pakistan, that's, that's because, um, you know, while there was a high, fairly high coverage, um, the, the transfer values were quite low or only one off or time bound. Um, and in Sierra Leone um, and in Uganda, where we didn't model the results, uh, it's likely to be the opposite, actually, where um, transfer values were relatively generous, but um, program coverage was low. Um, in terms of the um, final two dimensions that we looked at to assess the, um, the, the effectiveness of the responses, we had a look at gender and inclusion and also at timeliness. And um, in terms of inclusion, we found quite mixed results um, with some expansions ta being targeted um, either explicitly or implicitly at women um, or marginalized groups. 
Um, however, we also found quite a few um, examples um, of countries where the major um, social um, assistance response programs did not factor in gender considerations in the eligibility criteria. And some examples for this are um, the Prime Minister's cash support program in Bangladesh, um, but also the multi-agency cash uh, transfer in Kenya. Um, so in those instances where um, women or marginalized groups were not targeted explicitly or implicitly, um, what we did find is that a sort of an increasing reliance um, on technologies um, put women and more vulnerable groups at risk of exclusion. So while sort of the use of mobile of mobile payments or mobile solutions for enrollment and, and so on were all um, very good for, for um, efficiency and even timeliness, actually, um, there is a risk that they excluded um, some of the most vulnerable groups. Um, so just as an example, in Pakistan, Bangladesh and Kenya, um, the ownership of a mobile phone and also a national ID was, was necessary for both enrollment and the access of benefits. Um, and at the same time, of course, um, we do know that um, there are still sort of quite persistent gender gaps um, uh, in terms of mobile ownership, but also in terms of the percentage of population that has that has an ID. And finally, finally, in terms of timeliness, um, what we did find is that um, timeliness was a function um, of uh, the capacity of the existing administrative, but also delivery systems um, of political will and coordination, but also, of course, um, of the ability to mobilize funds and to mobilize them quickly. Um, to assess timeliness, we um, look at uh, we looked at two indicators. Um, the first one being the time that passed between the um, announcement of um, the containment measures and the first payment. Um, and what we found was that um, all Bangladesh, Kenya, and Pakistan um, managed to actually design and and roll out and deliver the first payments of their flagship pro flagship programs within um, one month. Um, of the start of containment measures. Um, at the same time, though, we found that um, any rollout in uh, Sierra Leone, Ethiopia, and especially Uganda was much, much um, slower. Um, and in, in Uganda, actually, even sort of until the first um, quarter, or, or I think even until now, the main um, sort of flagship uh, response program still hadn't been rolled out. So even 12 months later, um, the first payment hadn't been made. Um, and finally, sort of another uh, indicator that we looked at that also gives us another good sort of um, idea of, of timeliness and, and which countries managed to respond the quickest. Um, we also had a look at, um, so not only the time that passed, but also the speed at which um, countries managed to reach their full caseloads. Um, and what we did find is that by August 2020, Pakistan um, had reached sort of 95% of the um, target caseload of the it has um, emergency cash um, transfer program, while Bangladesh's um, uh, program had reached uh, about 66% of its target caseload and Kenya about 50% of the target caseload. Passing over to Alex, who's on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jana. Um, so I'll take over from here and I'll be covering um, some of the main findings in terms of the um, enablers and constraints to an effective response and cover some of the preparedness actions that are outlined in the report. Um, these are organized um, according to kind of policy areas, um, the design of the programs, and then lastly, the operations of the programs and how that um, enabled or constrained uh, their effectiveness. And we'll just go through some of the main findings in this presentation, but you can find the kind of full set of results and all of the recommendations in the synthesis report and in the research summary. So in terms of financing, um, all countries in the study faced uh, fiscal constraints, but their capacity to mobilize um, resources to fund the response was found to be a function of um, uh, the ability to reallocate funding, um, the ability to find new financing sources, and also um, political commitment to social protection, particularly at senior government. And this was the case in Kenya and Pakistan, where the president and prime minister um, made announcements about reallocations to finance the response. Some governments were also able to leverage pre-existing uh, pre external financing. 
And this was the case um, in Sierra Leone where the World Bank's loan for the third phase of the social safety net was flexible enough to accommodate new circumstances. But this also comes at the risk um, to, uh, to financing that was allocated to um, funding future routine social protection and the impact of using these, uh, these funds now um, on, the, on routine social protection kind of remains to be seen. Um, and so we, we recommend that effective shock responsive social protection planning is developed on the basis of first pre-agreed fin pre financial commitments um, which should include kind of financing strategies and also financial instruments that can be used to respond to a range of shocks, both those that are um, more predictable um, and occur with uh, higher frequency and those that are less predictable like COVID-19. Secondly, based on triggers for activation and similarly um, specific triggers, but also those that can be used to um, trigger fi financing for less predictable shocks. And thirdly, um, on contingency planning that can guide disbursement. And this also requires developing mechanisms um, that can ensure that funds can be channeled by government and donors in line with their requirements. In terms of legislation policies and strategies, we found that there, um, there needs to be a kind of careful balance for preparedness in terms of um, contingency planning at the program level. Um, and that has, in these countries, has mostly taken place in the um, form of scalability frameworks. Um, but also ensuring that the social protection system has sufficient uh, flexibility to respond to shocks, especially th those that are harder to predict. Um, so we found that there was a lack of policy frameworks that could guide sector-wide um, responses in these six countries. Um, and in Kenya, for example, this meant that the main response was implemented outside of the social protection sector. And also this resulted in kind of proliferation of responses. But at the same time, we found that scalability frameworks, particularly in Kenya and Uganda, didn't feature heavily in the response. And this is because they didn't have sufficient uh, flexibility to respond to a shock of this nature. Um, whereas countries like Pakistan and Sierra Leone, which didn't have specific scalability frameworks, were able to leverage experience of responding to previous shocks, um, including Ebola in Sierra Leone, um, and were able to implement um, timely responses. So we found that there's a need to ensure that uh, shock responsive social protection is mainstreamed within both social protection and disaster risk management legislative frameworks, policies, and strategies, and that this needs to be underpinned by a shock responsive inter institutional framework at the sector level um, rather than just at the program level that can facilitate um, decision making during times of shock. We also looked at governance and coordination and unsurprisingly, we found that kind of well-developed governance mechanisms and strong leaderships were, strong leadership was a key enabler of large scale responses. Um, this was the case in Pakistan, which took a whole of government approach and um, involved uh, a range of ministries and agencies, both at the federal and the provincial level in delivering um, a large scale response uh, very rapidly. And, Although this has been a recommendation in many other studies and said many times before, the, this, the findings of the study point to the need to continue to invest in and develop coordination mechanisms um, and ensure that these are functional prior to the onset um, of a shock. And this should be based on clear mandates and roles that are established by laws and policies um, on operational opportunities. So this means finding areas of collaboration for different agencies. So for example, um, in relation to information sharing and also based on pre-agreed uh, commitments about how to respond and the roles and responsibilities for responding. Um, the last area of policy that we looked at was around information systems and data sharing. And in these six countries, we didn't find that social registry data played a strong role at all in the response. Um, and this is counter to some of the findings that um, have come out of case studies in other countries. So it was only in Pakistan that the social registry data was leveraged, um, but here the data was um, out of date. And um, this meant that kind of poverty scores and also information on households uh, was not accurate. And there was a need to complement this with additional sources of data. Um, also in Bangladesh and Sierra Leone, um, there was a reliant on kind of alternative data sources to try to identify uh, households that could be targeted by these responses. And this included drawing on databases from um, national identity card systems, tax and revenue registries, 
uh, databases from telecom companies or other uh, ministries such as the Ministry of Social Welfare in Sierra Leone. Uh, we did find that registry data at the program level or integra integrated beneficiary registry data um, played a role in terms of allowing for vertical expansions in almost all of the countries. And in the case of Kenya, the program MISs were used to support deduplication with the routine social protection program. So ensuring that um, if uh, that the COVID-19 support didn't overlap with routine social protection um, where that was the goal. But again, this points to the need to continue to invest in information systems and not necessarily social registries, um, because this is not feasible or desirable in all contexts, but certainly information systems um, at the for, for routine programs and elsewhere. And this includes investing in uh, registries to ensure that they have high quality data um, that is current and accurate um, with good coverage, et cetera. Um, software that allows for the right type of interoperability. Um, and then importantly, um, procedures and human resources. So ensuring that um, protocols and processes are designed that are fit for purpose and that can allow um, various stakeholders to access data in a timely manner in times of shock, um, because this was found to be one of the key constraints um, during the response. Then we looked at the design of programs and kind of unsurprisingly, we found that the design decisions were made in a context of great uncertainty. Um, it was very difficult to know who was going to be affected and the scale of the population that would be affected. Um, and this is likely to be the case um, uh, when there are other kind of unpredictable shocks that are more um, like COVID-19. And so um, in order to guide decision-making and um, improve harmonization amongst the responses um, in order, and in order to be prepared for future shocks. Um, we recommend that, um, that governments develop protocols that can support business continuity and if envisaged also scale ups. And these could um, include principles for and con kind of considerations for identifying the appropriate target population, um, principles for thinking about how to set the benefit level and also the duration of support um, predefining the transfer mechanism and if there are any um, pre-shock agreements with uh, service providers, for example, payment service providers outlining what those are. And finally, principles for um, thinking about inclusivity of the, the response in terms of sources of marginalization, um, how to design the targeting and also how operations can affect inclusivity of the response. And then finally, we look at um, some of the, the operations. So we found that in these six countries, there was a, a big focus on two processes, and these were registration, verification, and enrollment, and also on payments, um, a much less focus on other, um, other aspects of delivery, such as communications or grievance and case management, et cetera. Um, so in terms of registration, we found um, that innovative approaches to registration enabled responses that were wide reaching and that were also timely. And these were necessary given the circumstances of COVID and the requirements around social distancing. Um, in Pakistan, for example, registration to the SS emergency cash program occurred through two channels. So one was a demand driven approach supported by SMS uh, services and a web portal. And the reliance on demand driven approaches also allowed them to register and enroll a large number of um, recipients in a very short amount of time. Um, and this was also combined with um, more traditional but time consuming in person um, registration. In other settings where uh, there was heavy reliance on traditional approaches, this took um, longer to implement um, and where data collection was done on paper, this also resulted in kind of poor data quality. Um, and large numbers of people being excluded because um, they couldn't uh, validate or verify the data at a later stage. Um, but we also found that there is a risk with um, kind of rapidly designed and implemented approaches that can come at the cost of a more inclusive and transparent uh, response. And so in some cases, there, were, there was a kind of a lack of check, checks and balances in place. Um, to validate or verify the data that was collected and that households did um, meet the eligibility criteria. And in, in Kenya, for example, there was heavy reliance on um, listing teams uh, to qualitatively assess need and 
to list those households that were that they deemed to meet the eligibility criteria um, with no process of validation. So that in some senses, this could undermine the transparency of the response. And so for better preparedness, there's a need to develop protocols for registration, verification, and enrollment that can be used during times of shocks. And these should be based on the um, procedures that are followed during routine, um, routine processes, but tweaked um, to be and, and adapted for, for the various responses, um, but still ensuring that, um, that the, uh, there's transparency to the process and that there is a process of verification and validation. Finally, we looked at payments and we found that timely delivery was supported by a strong enabling environment for banking, mobile money and internet enabled digital payments. Uh, this was the case in Kenya um, where mobile money was um, used across the responses and also where a fee waiver on low value transactions facilitated um, the use of mobile money. But there is also a risk that technology can lead to exclusion of the most vulnerable um, people, especially those that don't have access to the technology um, or that don't want to use this technology. Um, and so if digital payment solutions are going to be used um, more commonly in routine social protection, but also in shock response, there's a need to ensure that um, this is coupled with strategies that can um, enable people to register with these digital payment providers, but also to ensure that alternative payment modalities are um, available for those who need them. And finally, as I mentioned, uh, we looked at accountability mechanisms. And in these six countries, this wasn't a focus of the responses. Um, uh, we found they were largely absent or um, ineffective. And again, this points to the need to invest in accountability mechanisms, um, firstly, in routine social protection so that these mechanisms can be scaled up uh, during times of shock. Um, and this is an area where the social protection sector can learn from humanitarian actors and disaster risk management sector about how these can be scaled up. Uh, in terms of m and &E, uh, we recognize that it wouldn't be feasible to conduct an evaluation of all of the responses, um, but there do need to be minimum standards um, about what uh, data should be available on, on the responses. So for example, uh, ensuring that final beneficiary numbers are publicly available, and this is disaggregated um, by gender and, some, and, and perhaps some other important uh, variables. So this brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, I'll hand back to Rodolfo, and thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, uh, Alex and uh, Yana, uh, for a great presentation. You managed to summarize uh, six rich uh, country case studies in a synthesis report in a 20 minute presentation. So great, thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, let me ask uh, Anthony and, and Valentina, let's start with Anthony, to uh, react a little bit to this uh, presentation, uh, with a five minute uh, intervention each. So Anthony, uh, over to you. Yeah, thanks, um, Rodolfo, um, and then the entire socialprotection.org team um, for the opportunity to comment on this. Uh, and firstly, it's just to thank uh, the OPM team and the entire maintains um, um, uh, program for an excellent job in pulling this um, together. Um, and also to all those who contributed to the research, you know, from the six countries. Um, I think it's clear that, you know, COVID-19 has had a profound impact um, on the dynamics of poverty. Uh, globally and more so in um, in developing countries um, and clearly social protection has been used um, as a key tool um, just in terms of um, governments and other development actors um, you know responding to the negative um, you know economic impacts of the pandemic um, so it's, it's quite a good time I think for us to be discussing this now uh, one year down the line uh, to evaluate how the sector, you know, has performed um, within the six um, countries and reviewing some of the interventions that uh, happen within the, the, the maintains uh, focus countries. Um, and I think the, the, the evaluation um, or, or this piece of work uh, provides an excellent synthesis um, that is quite useful, um, you know, in terms of learning um, um, and, and, and for um, uh, influencing policy going forward. Uh, I think in terms of the actual review, um, uh, and the findings, I think the study does validate, um, you know, some of the existing evidence that is associated with the, 
with the impacts of um, you know social protection, specifically um, social assistance, um, um, and um, uh, especially in terms of um, you know their uses in, in in the response to shocks um, and crisis management. Um, I think it's, it's it's quite clear that it does validate. Um, I think it's also good to see. Um, you know, the variations and differences between the various countries in terms of, um, you know, the use of um, innovation and technology, um, you know, for various functions in terms of social assistance. Um, so whether it's in, you know, the enrollment um, uh, where technology was deployed or whether it's in um, sort of the digital financial services that, um, you know, were used in, in, in the various countries to reach um, this new vulnerable uh, population. Um, I think there are some surprising findings um, um, that, that, you know, uh, are, are also quite important for us to reflect on so that we can, um, you know, um, positively, uh, you know, contribute to policy. Um, I think in terms of um, exclusion, um, in terms of um, sort of the lack of grievance uh, mechanisms, I think all these are, are findings that uh, I know we will be discussing during, um, during this uh, webinar. Um, so uh, in summary, really looking forward to um, uh, this rich uh, or a rich discussion. Uh, and, and I hope this is the first of many um, that uh, we can start as, as uh, development practitioners. Um, and then we can start also engaging with others, including government uh, within, within the various um, settings to be able to um, you know, formulate better policy around this area. Um, and, and, and thanks to the social protection um, dot org team for providing a platform for this. Um, back to you, Rodolfo. Great, Anthony. Thank you very much. Uh, vale? Hi, thanks, everyone. Um, and yeah, so just echoing what, what Anthony has just been saying. Um, so first of all, a, a massive thank you for, for all of you and I, a big invitation to, to actually be, be reading the case studies. I personally have already been drawing from them extensively as examples of specific points that they're very practical. They really zone into detailed issues, including those aspects that often aren't documented in the literature, such as, for example, grievance and accountability mechanisms is one example. What another really special thing is they, they delve into the decision making processes to some extent. And that's partly because you had uh, in country experts that were, that were supporting you in, in the process. So it gives you that sense of why certain decisions were taken, why and why others were dropped and what, what those trade that were being faced were and kind of along along that process and um, obviously that only by looking at, at what we've done we're able to kind of fix things and, and work better going forward so kind of a lot of learning in there to, to be working on um, everything that you've been saying and of, it tallies with what we've been seeing kind of in in our space country engagements we've been working with with over 40 countries the ODI case studies that have recently been released that I also invite people to be to be looking at um, the the World Bank mapping together with others and the IPCIG dashboard which you can also start browsing um, we, we've tried to consolidate some of the links to, to a lot of the emerging case studies that have been coming from all over the place in, in a useful resources document that hopefully someone can can share on the chat um, there, there's a lot for us to be studying going forwards, that, that's for sure. Um, this framing that you can see is, is basically almost a, a summary of everything that, uh, that has been shared by Jana and Alex up to now. And it's just to show how aligned we've been with space and to kind of just look at everything we've been saying so far visually. And first of all, if on the left, you can see that, that gray cube representing routine social protection. And, and one point you really made fundamental point is that the strength of that core system of what's already in place in country made a massive difference in terms of what countries could do in terms of responding. Um, we, we've seen that across country after country and, and it's about those range of programs covering different types of, of risks, working together across social insurance, social assistance and labor market policies. And then you, you stressed again, really fundamental point on that the crucial aspect of system resilience, that system not collapsing when the shock hits and all of those minor tweaks and changes that need to happen in order for that system not to collapse. So surges in capacity, get, getting rid maybe, maybe of some existing features such as the conditionalities, making slight changes to, to the payments uh, approaches, you, you've, you've discussed those in depth. Another thing you've done is, is um, and, and I think all of, all of the, the data that's emerging on, on the response to COVID is sort of debunking. Sometimes when we used to think about shock responsive social protection, we were just focusing on these horizontal and vertical expansions and just thinking about those two dimensions and focusing on one program, horizontally and vertically expanding. 
um, this, I mean, it's really important to be dispelling that myth. It's, it's often not even about one existing program extending its coverage. It's about new programs coming in to fill the gaps, obviously leveraging existing systems. It might be new programs that are led by the social protection sector. In many countries, it was programs that were led by other sectors, DRM, humanitarian, filling in those gaps and working together cohesively to achieve common outcomes. Um, and, and very often, again, it, it was about a sequence of different programs that were layered. Maybe the, the first layer was sort of a quick, swift response with whatever was, was feasible in the short term, and then slowly adding additional kind of layers of responses to address kind of the, the remaining needs that, that had remained unaddressed. And, and Peru is a, is a good example of this. Having said that, uh, you also brought out the important uh, aspect of, of trade-offs. Kind of, uh, many countries were facing very significant trade-offs, and you you discussed the trade-off, for example, between adequacy and coverage. And we also saw coverage very often being um, definitely chosen by government systems, especially kind of over over adequacy of, of the response. There was that pressing issue of timeliness, which obviously pushed countries to just do whatever they could. Uh, with what they had rather than, than try and come up with something new. And so a lot of the design and implementation choices that were made by countries were intrinsically tied to what was feasible to, again, to what was already there in the system. And there's nothing wrong with this as long as we're clear on the objectives we're, we're trying to achieve and uh, that we're clear in, in terms of understanding the risks that emerge when we choose for example, one aspect over another uh, in terms of these intended outcomes and that we're mitigating each and every one of those risks with the social inclusion, gender and social inclusion really being a crucial one that very often was, was compromised in the response and that we really need to be looking at um, going forward. Um, this brings me to, to, to the last point, as you can see this bar coming out of the routine, that gray cube, you can see the bar coming out of it. And what what's inside it's not an empty cube that what really counts there is is the what's inside it it's the kind of the quality and the level of institutionalization of, of the underlying system of social protection and that's what you can see what we're calling this the social protection solar system it doesn't matter what what we call this but it's those layers that you've been analyzing in in kind of you discussing in in your presentations looking at the role of of policy aspects the, the, the strength of the underlying legal and policy framework, a paper that Rodolfo and some other colleagues did for space, we're looking at the drivers of timely responses and that a kind of strong underlying legal and policy framework was an important driver. National commitments and, and financing were important drivers of uh, timely and high scale responses, that the importance of governance and coordination, etc. The outer layer of program design, having a system that's able to identify shifting needs in terms of poverty, vulnerability, risks, and translating that into swift decisions on what benefits and services we should be providing, how eligibility might be shifting and, and level of, of transfer values and, and services. And then that outer layer, which you probably recognize as the delivery system, that the nuts and bolts, which again, in, in this response, constrained us in terms of what was feasible and going forward, hopefully, uh, will be less of a constraint if, if we've learned those lessons. Over, thanks. Amazing, Valentina, great. Thank you very much for, for the feedback, very encouraging. I hope everyone is gonna read our reports with this level of detail. Um, and now we, we move to the, the second uh, block, uh, which, which is the discussion. Um, the idea is that uh, I'm gonna be um, asking some questions to the discussants. Uh, I'm gonna uh, pick a primary discussion that then the others can, can, can chip in as well. Uh, and I'm gonna try to be a little bit uh, provocative with the, with the questions. And they're of course, based on, on the findings of, of the research, no? So uh, let's get started with this. So the, the, the first issue that we wanted to, to discuss, no? So one of the fairly surprising findings of the research was that the, the responses in Kenya and Uganda did not leverage the scalability frameworks of the flagship uh, programs. These frameworks, what they do is they, they front load uh, key decisions regarding when to scale up, who to target, what benefit to provide, and they are supported by, by, by financial commitments. No? And the whole purpose of these frameworks is to enable fast uh, responses. 
these scalability frameworks, they were designed mostly uh, at program level and to respond to, to droughts, no? And of course, the COVID-19 is, is a very different kind of, of shock, no? So the question would be, um, what is the, the appropriate balance between contingency planning at program level, for example, in terms of scalability frameworks, and ensuring that the system has the flexibility required to respond? And this is probably a sub-question within a broader question that is how to prepare programs and systems to respond to shocks. Let me, let me ask uh, Anthony to answer this question first, given his, his experience in, in, in Kenya, but I think it's gonna be very, very good for this, 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 this discussion. And then others can, can also complement. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks Rodolfo for um, this question, uh, which is, is, is quite interesting um, in, in the broad spectrum of things. Um, and, I, and I guess the, there needs to be a balance um, um, between where to invest. Um, um, and I think, you know, program level scalability frameworks um, have been very useful uh, in the past in terms of mitigating against uh, um, or, or managing um, um, natural shocks, uh, mostly climatic, um, such as uh, drought. Um, uh, and I think it has been right to invest in, in, in these program level, uh, you know, scalability uh, mechanisms, given that um, especially drought, um, you know, has been uh, one of the single or, or the single biggest contributor to economic losses, um, especially within the, 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 the Africa uh, region. So I think there's merit in, 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 in the work that has gone into, um, you know, setting those uh, frameworks up. And um, I think they have uh, been immensely successful uh, in the management of um, um, that particular hazard. Um, but COVID-19 has exposed the limitations of, uh, you know, what we can do with these frameworks. Um, uh, just in terms of, um, you know, the mismatch between um, what the frameworks, you know, were designed for and um, sort of the new vulnerable uh, population that was created um, as a result of um, the pandemic. Um, but I think there are, um, um, you know, some tweaks, um, there are some investments that can be made um, to ensure that, um, you know, the frameworks um, which were designed for um, natural hazards such as drought, um, can, they can be able to be flexible um, in order to be able to respond to other um, you, uh, no, no novel um, shocks. So um, whether it's um, being able to um, um, use the frameworks or having the frameworks open um, to be able to plug into other data sources, um, whether it's um, and, and, and this was one of the main challenges that we have found um, just in terms of responding to, to COVID. Um, I think the lack of data um, and the lack of access uh, either to poverty data, census data, um, data held by mobile money providers. Um, so we, we have found that there's a rich set of data that is held uh, both in um, uh, public and, and, and private um, 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 resources that, um, you know, is not available um, to the frameworks to use um, in, in, in an event such as COVID-19 and to respond to um, sort of the emerging needs. Uh, so I think investing in uh, ensuring that, you know, the frameworks themselves are able to, or their agreements um, that can facilitate um, program frameworks to access um, wider data sets, I think would be quite a good investment just in terms of having a system-wide approach. Um, I also think that, um, uh, and this is one of the findings that, um, you know, the, the, the research, um, you know, has indicated that a, a sector or, or system-wide approach is required um, to effectively respond to, um, um, you know, um, new, um, new shocks such as COVID-19. Um, and therefore, you know, having that coordinated approach between uh, multiple government agencies, between um, you know, other actors, I think can really help um, um, to prepare and, and, and ensure that um, systems are talking to, to, to each other. Thanks. Great, Anthony, thank you very much. Now the valet is raising a finger. 
Yeah, I just want to add one sentence to what Anthony, I agree with everything you said, Anthony, and the, 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 um, that the way we classified this within the transform shock responsive social protection module is there's almost two different types of shocks and we call these problem one and problem two. And kind of one of these are, are those types of shocks that are relatively recurrent, predictable, kind of we know they're coming in our country uh, and uh, that they, they don't overwhelm our systems. We, we can prepare for them. And in fact, our, our social protection system should be responding to these no matter what. They're, they're in fact an intrinsic role of our, our social protection system that the chronic poverty and vulnerability fully overlap and then there's those types of shocks that are more one-off more completely overwhelming national systems kind of very large in scale at, at, at national level and obviously those will require a slightly different approach and and he, covid is is that type of problem it, but this still doesn't mean that that flexibility that you mentioned is not fundamental so all the points you made agree with i just wanted to give this sense of those two problems Great, thanks, Vale. Uh, Madomita, Jana, Alex, anything to add? Okay, great. So I'll take this opportunity basically to uh, say that um, oftentimes when we talk about giving uh, more flexibility to the system, it sounds something that is difficult to achieve and it's in fact difficult to achieve, but there are certain things that can be done, certain adjustments to, to the system that can allow it to be more flexible. No? And these are things that we have discussed a lot in, in this research and in others. Uh, and so there are certain tweaks from, from the payment mechanism to the information system and so on that can give the system this type of flexibility. No? So I would say that it's it's about investing in both no? this uh, ex-ante planning, no? uh, front-loading decisions, because we know about the, the importance of, and the benefits of that, but also giving the system the flexibility required. No? Great, okay, so we move to the second uh, question. Um, as you have seen uh, in the presentation, and I think that Alex mentioned this, um, so uh, the, 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 the responses in the, in the countries that we studied, they didn't uh, rely much on the uh, social registry data. No? Uh, this is because the only country from the six countries uh, that we studied that has a social registry in use is Pakistan, and it was the data is uh, five years out of date. And of course, it, it needed to be complemented with, with other uh, data sources. No? But we know that there is currently a lot of enthusiasm in global debates about the role of uh, social registries in informing shock responses. And it is true that, that countries with uh, registries with fairly high coverage manage to reach uh, large seg segments of the population and to respond faster on average uh, to the pandemic. Um, however, many countries do not have these registries in place or the registries are quite underdeveloped or outdated. No? So in relation to this, uh, the question would, would be, what are uh, social what, what roles so social registries and wider information systems are going to play in the future of shock responses and overall social protection programming? And let me be a bit provocative here. Uh, should countries start developing and expanding social registries? Uh, let me ask uh, Vale to answer uh, first and then uh, others. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Rodolfo. So the first thing I'd like to say, and it's similar to what I was saying before, that, that what happened with COVID-19 really needs to be put into context. So there's a reason why social registries in, in 80 plus countries, according to the, the IPCIG data, were, were used quite extensively this time round and hardly ever before in response to shock. So in, in research that in fact Rodolfo and I had done prior to COVID, this had hardly ever been the case and it was for, for very good reasons. So what, what was particular about COVID, we've been saying this very high percentage of population affected at national level, not, not just your usual suspects. So that there was very often a high overlap between those affected and those already registered where the coverage of the registry was high enough. Um, there was very high visibility of the need to respond and pressure to act quickly. So again, this kind of go for whatever I can do approach, especially in the first phases of the response. 
um, there was generally a higher willingness for, for no regrets and less refined approaches, at, at least to start with, um, and little preparedness to be doing this. So the, the choices that countries had were very limited by design and implementation feasibility. So they used whatever they had where a social registry was in place that was considered just good enough, it, it was used in COVID. And one last thing to stress is that even where social registries were used in the COVID response, they were mostly used as a layer, maybe a first layer of the response, and then more was built on top of that, a lot more. So Pakistan is an example, Peru is another, another example. There's many countries where the social registries data was just used as an in initial kind of trigger for, for some households, and then uh, more on-demand approaches were, were used for others. Now, the, the second thing I want to say is that and I've been saying this for a long while, is that it's really important not just to look at, at social registries, but look at the, the broader data ecosystem that the social protection information system in the country and how it relates to, to data coming from, from other sources and looking at how that can be strengthened for future shocks, building on, on what we've learned now while kind of having a strong focus on, on mitigating emerging risks. So any system that's relying on existing data that's not complementing with new data will create exclusion and we cannot have a system that, that does just that. Um, so we've been seeing existing data used in multiple ways, Anthony, and, and also that the presentation have, have been saying this, tax data, financial inclusion data in, in India, utilities data in Guatemala, health insurance data in Morocco, voter registration, mobile phone data, uh, many countries using sort of complex data pooling approaches going for almost targeting out, starting from their CRVS or ID system as, as a backbone and then getting rid of certain population groups by, by pooling data from multiple sources. And each and every one of these approaches was problematic from different perspectives. It, it was obviously great in terms of achieving those outcomes of, of speed and, and coverage, but but even where the intention was universally leaning, they, they were problematic. And, and unless we explicitly address that uh, and sort of balance this, this need for interoperability, that we're not going backwards on, on this trend, um, but we need to be balancing this greater interoperability with, with kind of a focus on data protection and security and, and a focus on who is left out. The, the, the advantages that we reap, the efficiency gains, kind of we, we can reinvest those in, in, in reaching who is left out. And um, Ultimately, we, we need to remember that, that uh, thinking about an information system is also about the capacity that's behind it, the, the people, the systems, the tools that, that can be tweaked and changed to, for example, support on-demand online registration, which is what we saw many countries do. Um, and ultimately, kind of, I, I can go back to some of the points that, that Rodolfo and I made pre-COVID and, and uh, in terms, it's not about having a social registry, but it, it's make sh making sure that your information system reflects your policy choices that including future possible choices and, and tweaks that might be needed in, in case of a shock. And, and so think about complete, completeness, relevance of your data, whether it's up to date, accessible, accurate. Um, ensuring data protection, et cetera. So uh, I, I, we can share some resources on that. Thank you. Thanks, Vale, for your very comprehensive answer. Um, Jana, Alex, Anthony, um, Matumita. I'm going to okay. take up on your uh, controversial question on whether countries should look at expanding uh, social registries. I think it's a very polarized uh, debate. Uh, I get the enthusiasm at this point in time when the memory of COVID is very, very recent. Uh, but I think it's important to remember that a lot of the low and middle income countries uh, still don't have the uh, uh, capacity and the financing to meet the six data quality parameters that you, I think you and Bali set out in a people a few years ago, right? Uh, in terms of having the capacity to ensure that data is uh, up to date, given poverty is so dynamic, uh, ensuring that uh, data sharing arrangements exist that also are in line with international standards on data protection and uh, privacy, and to also ensure that at the end of the day, the data being collected by these registries is uh, relevant for shock response. Uh, I think the structural barriers to that has not changed, right? So I think it's important to uh, remember that before sort of enthusiastically pursuing expanded coverage on the back of 
uh, uh, the recent memories of uh, COVID. I think uh, that's my two cents on that. Thank you. Thanks, Matumita. Um, I couldn't agree more. I mean, um, we, have even, we even know that uh, countries with fairly developed social protection systems and, and social registries, they are still struggling with updating data, sharing data, and so on. So this is a this, uh, this is an issue to keep in mind for sure. Okay. Uh, so uh, Anthony, you want to chip in or? Yeah, just very quickly, um, um, because I, I really agree with uh, Valentina's point in terms of just looking at the, the, the entire data ecosystem, um, because, you know, although um, social registries are, are primarily built, um, you know, to respond or to, to, to facilitate social protection programs, I think there is merit in thinking about, you know, the entire data ecosystems, and we find that even in developing countries, like, there, there, there is investment that is made um, into creating um, databases and creating um, um, data points that are not necessarily for social protection um, um, interventions, um, but can assist uh, in implementing social protection interventions. So I think there's merit in, in, in just trying to, um, um, you know, think more broadly um, than social protection action interventions and that where investments are made um, into a social registry, that social registry is able to cover much more than um, sort of the social protection sector and can cover other poverty um, sort of focused uh, programs and can be used to inform, um, you know, policy um, uh, within other sectors as well. And that makes um, or, or, or will make, um, you know, the building of social registries where, you know, there's physical space to do that a bit more uh, feasible and makes um, makes it um, a bit more value for money. Thanks. Excellent, great, thank you, Anthony. Okay, so now let's move to the next question. Um, okay, um, so this is about technology, no? Uh, technology can, can improve uh, service delivery, especially in terms of its timeliness, uh, cost, and uh, transparency, but it can also lead to the exclusion uh, of the most uh, vulnerable groups of society, as uh, Alex and Diana uh, showed in their presentation. So the question would be, uh, what should the role of new technologies for service delivery be, um, and how to ensure uh, that the delivery remains inclusive uh, when incorporating those those technologies, so let me let me ask uh, Madumita to answer this question first. Thank you. Thanks, Rodolfo. Um, so I guess whenever technology solutions are being used for service delivery, we only just need to ask who we are leaving behind uh, by making this technology choice, and what alternative mechanisms can be put in place. And this in developing countries often means combining traditional analog models of delivery with digital ones. And we see this in the case of uh, Bangladesh's COVID-19 uh, response, which was uh, studied as part of this research. While the new emergency cash transfer did rely on uh, the national ID, interoperability-based verification and digital payments, uh, uh, although with a mixed degree of success, other programs at the local level uh, were in place to support those who may have been digitally excluded. And the methods to ask for on-demand support uh, were also either physical, uh, involving local governments, uh, or quite low-tech via uh, phone hotlines, uh, right? So uh, I think these hybrid approaches uh, will need to be in place to make sure that technology doesn't uh, exclude. Uh, and sometimes there is reluctance to go for such hybrid approaches uh, because technology is seen as a very tempting solution uh, for systemic challenges that are related to costs and capacity. Right? However, what's increasingly becoming clear uh, over the course of the last decade is that technology only changes the type of capacity that is needed rather than replacing or substituting the need for capacity. And because the path to digital inclusion is a very gradual one for the foreseeable future, uh, digital delivery will need human intermediaries. Uh, again, in the case of uh, 
Bangladesh. We see with the case of the wage subsidies to factory uh, workers, uh, where mobile payments were made uh, mandatory. Offline intermediation by trade unions was very, very important uh, to ensure the rapid account opening of millions of accounts um, uh, in a single month, just as uh, COVID hit. Uh, I will stop there and let others react now. Great, thanks, uh, Madam Any others? Valentina, you seem to... Uh, <laughs> I was waiting to see if anyone else was coming in. Alex, Yana, any, anyone else? Otherwise, I just one sentence here as well. Um, it's, it's, Go ahead. <laughs> No, just, just to say that, yeah, it, that, that last point on the intermediation, I think, is fundamental. And we've seen that happen in country and country again. And that intermediation has been played by different actors. You mentioned trade unions. In other countries, it was informal work organizations. I'm thinking of, of Thailand, and that's well documented by, by Weigel. Um, in other countries, it was kind of local women's groups and, and community groups. And in, in many countries, it was actually humanitarians sort of playing a complementary role in terms of supporting people access those, those benefits and services they were entitled to, but they were struggling to, to, to be receiving because of some of those, those digital barriers. And also, uh, I wanted to make a plug to a, to a paper that, that we published on inclusive information systems, gender and disability inclusive, just thinking how, yeah, we can be sh kind of shifting that, that debate on digital to actually be uh, it, furthering inclusion rather than, than exacerbating exclusion. Over. Great. Thanks, Marlene. Um, um, maybe just to add yeah. in, um, I think it will be interesting to see in some of the case study countries um, how how this plays out. So um, there were a number, I think, in at least Sierra Leone and Uganda, um, and well, Kenya as well. Uh, this was an opportunity to pilot the use of mobile money payments. Um, I mean, in Kenya, we saw uh, take up across all programs of, um, I think, solely in PESA, in fact. Um, which is likely to have some, some impact on the inclusiveness of the response, given that not everybody, um, there is very high coverage of MPESA, but not universal. Um, but in countries like Uganda and Sierra Leone, where um, mobile money is much less used, it will be interesting to see um, how the pilots of, of introducing these into the um, cash transfers goes and what the experiences of beneficiaries um, and whether this is um, going to be viable. Um, and I think the point that you made that there's a lot of enthusiasm about um, picking up on these technologies, um, perhaps in places that uh, aren't necessarily um, ready to roll these out universally in programs, um, what, is, is something that we saw in some of these responses. Thanks, Alex. Um, great. Um, let's move to the next one, uh, so that we can cover more, more ground. Um, Okay, so um, another interesting and, and, and quite disappointing finding of, of the research was the, the overall lack of accountability mechanisms in the responses implemented in the, in the countries. No? So a question for, for you. Uh, what are the minimum standards for accountability in shock responses and how to develop uh, and implement such mechanisms in a crisis uh, context? No? Let me, uh, uh, can I ask uh, Anthony to answer the, this question? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rodolfo, for, for, for this. Um, and I think you put it rightly. I think it was disappointing to see, um, you know, the lack of accountability mechanisms, especially within um, government-led responses. Um, you know, although, um, you know, outside, you know, sort of this study, I think there was, uh, we did see some pockets of, of uh, mechanisms uh, within the civil society, within NGOs that included accountability mechanisms um, uh, within, within the interventions. And as we all know, I think accountability plays a big role uh, in the success and impact of, uh, um, you know, any poverty reduction program, more so within social assistance, um, given, given the role um, that accountability plays um, in, in, in ensuring um, um, good targeting uh, and, and, and the reduction of um, sort of inclusion and exclusion errors. Um, I think there's a question actually in the in the chat bar, um, um, which gives an example of Bangladesh. And um, 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 I think it's Sifula who asked the question and, you know, indicates that there, there, there were a lot of, um, you know, errors in terms of um, 
um, the people who uh, were ultimately, um, you know, targeted for, for for the social assistance program. So my sense is that in a crisis context, I think accountability mechanisms are even more important. Um, um, because leaving out the most vulnerable, you know, can can, can create a situation where, um, 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 you know, your intervention does not have uh, as much impact as it should be. Um, and my sense is that, you know, any grievance uh, sort of mechanism should be quite simple, uh, especially in, in a crisis context. I think it should be um, quite simplistic. I think it should be easy to understand. It should be um, decentralized and available to, you know, the communities that, um, you know, are, are being affected. Um, I think the use of technology uh, can assist with this, and there's evidence to show that, um, um, you know, if multiple functions of a cash transfer are done, uh, potentially using one mechanism. So, for example, if it's, it's if it is the mobile phone that is being used to, um, you know, deliver um, um, social assistance to beneficiaries, I, I think using the same platform also for a, a grievance mechanism can be able to improve. Um, uh, and enhance um, um, sort of the functions of um, of, of the GRM. Um, I think in slower time, uh, sort of grievance mechanisms should be um, developed for wider poverty reduction interventions so that they form um, the core of any intervention and are not seen as an add-on. Um, um, and, 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 you know, this should be formed, you know, within the communities and there should be investment made within the communities so, such that any interventions uh, during a crisis uh, period find an already, um, uh, an already formed mechanism um, to handle, to handle um, um, the accountability part. Um, so thanks, Rodolfo, and um, uh, over to my co-panelists uh, for any points. Thanks, Anthony. Um, okay, maybe just to okay. pick up um, right. on your point, um, I think the Kenya example is very interesting because there were so many different responses. Um, some of the government responses didn't have a strong emphasis on grievance mechanisms, but a lot of the um, responses led by uh, non-state actors did. Um, but as you say, um, making it simple can can increase uptake of these of these mechanisms. And I think one of the problems in Kenya that we saw is that there were lots of different grievance mechanisms, um, lots of different responses, but also overlapping in terms of um, supporting the same areas. So many of the responses were concentrated in Nairobi and Mombasa. And um, this made it very difficult for uh, recipients of the, the cash transfers to, to be clear on which grievance mechanism to use. And I think this was also exacerbated um, for some of the vertical expansions because um, uh, routine beneficiaries were not directed to the grievance mechanism of the Inua Jami, but rather to the um, kind of grievance mechanism that was set up only for the response. Um, and so I think preparedness also requires kind of thinking about how these should be implemented and ensuring that there's harmonization and, and a lot more simplicity so that um, when they're in place, they're also easy to take up um, and used by people. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Yana, you want to? Yeah, no, the other point just to add on this um, maybe is also the point around communication, right? Because um, in order, you know, for a grievance mechanism to work, people actually also need to know and understand, first of all, what are the eligibility criteria and what are they, in theory, entitled to receive and who is entitled to receive that, right? And I think we've also sort of looked um, in, in as part of the case studies at, at some of these points regarding communication. And we also saw that even, you know, on that first step, there were quite some challenges um, that, that, you know, the different programs faced as well. And I suppose, especially picking up on the, Alec, the point that Alex made with regards to proliferation of programs and um, that, you know, sometimes align transfer values and sometimes not, I think it gets very, very difficult then for people also to sort of understand, you know, who is supposed to be receiving what and why are certain decisions regarding transfer values made. And, and, and you know, I mean, I think that's sort of the first building block that needs to be in, in place to have a sort of a very clear communication strategy before, um, and, then, and then sort of the grievance mechanisms sort of builds onto that, right? Because if there's no information and people don't actually even know what they are supposed to get and who's supposed to get it, then, um, everything else gets even more tricky and confusing. Thanks, Yana. Thank you very much. 
Um, okay, so let's uh, let's answer a couple of questions. So we have a, a, a good number of questions. Uh, let's answer a few of them um, in the 15 minutes that we got. Um, so there is a question from uh, Lisa. Um, hello, Lisa. Um, about uh, the humanitarian system, no? Uh, what do you think the key things that the humanitarian system could or should have done to support uh, governments in the COVID uh, response? Would, would that have, a, that would have made a difference, she's asking, no? And it is true that we haven't uh, focused a lot on the discussion about the humanitarian uh, system and how it linked with social protection and, and what would, would have been done and what, what have been done. So yeah, let me share the question with, with you. Um, anyone who wants to answer? And start giving an answer while, while the others uh, come in. So with space, we've actually, I mean, we, we've obviously worked in a lot of contexts where the humanitarian system actually played a major role because the social protection system was nascent or fragmented or um, kind of broadly, yeah, not not capable of responding to the shock to, to the extent uh, it, it 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 should have given the the, the context. And um, we've seen a lot of emerging, emerging practice worldwide beyond the countries that we've been in, engaging in. Uh, I can share, for example, the, the Grand Bargain case studies from the Grand Bargain subgroup on linking humanitarian social protection um, and, and social protection, which really kind of dig into many of, of the examples of how this has happened in practice in, in many countries. And I think that the strong underlying message is um, a kind of under, understanding each other's systems under so for, for a humanitarian actor to understand uh, how social protection operates kind of what constraints it's working under um and and what those building blocks are for example of those social protection solar system that we've been discussing and providing support kind of at each and every one of, of those steps possibly just some of those elements and not others kind of where th there is clear capacity from the humanitarian sector that can be complementing government capacity or in in view of, of longer term um uh, supports kind of and that it being institutionalized into a government system and we've seen that happen a lot um uh, one really interesting example comes from madagascar where long-term support from several government counterparts in country translated in the COVID response into a, a joint response where there was sort of technical capacity given to the government, which was sitting in a very strong leadership position. But at the same time, uh, the humanitarian actors were, were complementing the, the government response uh, with technical capacity, but also additional response that was coordinated and strong coordination happening at, at every level. Um, so using similar mechanisms, similar targeting criteria, uh, and uh, working together to achieve common outcomes, as said in, in very crude ways uh, over to the others. Anyone else wants to answer? Yeah, Alex? Um, just to go back to the case of Kenya again, um, I think here, here we saw um, almost the opposite of what Vale was just describing with um, where there was a kind of lack of strong coordination mechanism. Um, and almost three months in the Kenya Cash Working Group came in to try to coordinate the response. But by this stage, it was already, um, you know, many responses were being designed, some of them were being implemented. And this is this lack of coordination and kind of lack of agreement amongst humanitarian and social protection actors about how to respond. Um, I think was one of the key um, factors that led to uh, proliferation and and such a kind of uh, patchwork of responses. Um, and so, so I think that here, yeah, um, I think the coordination mechanism was really key and maybe agreements between kind of social protection actors and humanitarian actors about how to respond and how to align that response to, especially when they're going to be working in similar areas. Um, can, can help to strengthen it. So I, I, I think it just comes down to ways, uh, finding ways of working together um, rather than um, working, working in parallel, which I think we saw happening quite a bit in Kenya. Thanks, Alex. Great. Um, okay, so there is, there is another question about, uh, let me find it here. 
So about the the governance of the the response in in uh, Bangladesh. So even though the response uh, had a pretty high coverage, uh, there is a comment about uh, the response uh, not reaching those who are uh, mostly in, in need, about political leaders uh, deciding who should be in the list, and, and so on, no? mostly about uh, governance. Um, Madumita, you, you, you led the Bangladesh case study, so I wanted to, to ask you about, about this, this, this issue to you. Sure. I think leakage and patronage politics is a long-standing challenge in Bangladesh, both with social protection as well as disaster relief, right? And I don't want to single out the country. I think it is the case in uh, large uh, parts of South Asia, at least. Uh, so it's no surprise that this familiar tale repeated itself during the crisis, uh, when the transparency and accountability were even harder to uh, achieve. Uh, so the routine system uh, regarding accountability uh, needs to be strengthened first uh, for uh, shock responsive social protection responses to draw on during a crisis, right? Uh, I, I don't think we can build anything specifically for shock response without having built the foundations of the routine system uh, first. And there are several um, uh, reforms going on in the country to address this issue of accountability. And, and I think uh, uh, Anthony described some of the issues that are at the heart of building the, uh, accountability systems. Uh, but the, at the end of the day, there are no neat technical uh, solutions to this question, right? Because uh, power and politics is at the heart of this. Uh, there is a power that's vested in local governments that goes well beyond social protection and research in Bangladesh has consistently uh, shown that uh, this power also means that people are reluctant to raise uh, complaints uh, when it comes to ineffective targeting in many areas. Uh, this has spurred uh, a set of reforms around centralizing targeting, particularly through a social registry, uh, but it's not clear that this would give uh, the answers that people need either, right? Uh, because research, particularly in relation to the uh, primary education stipend program in Bangladesh, where payments were centralized, uh, shows that this level of centralization takes away the ability of citizens to communicate with the uh, state, right? So uh, it has a different kind of effect on uh, uh, accountability at the end of the day. And this uh, trade-off between the level of centralization um, in targeting is yet to be resolved, uh, I think. And I'm curious to hear what other panelists have to say from other countries in this regard. Thanks, Matamita. Uh, Valentina? No, I think just one really quick comment I would add, and again, not, not really knowing the Bangladesh con context, but just wanting to, to focus on also the, the transparency aspect and the importance. I mean, we really see a divergence in the COVID responses of countries that went for very simple, easily understandable eligibility criteria is what Jana was, was mentioning before and how that can enhance sort of transparency and, and, and that being understood by people kind of the, the broadly kind of accepted and and, uh, and and countries instead where there were very quite complex and black box type approaches to the response that did create kind of unrest and, and uh, dissatisfaction even where those responses were relatively high coverage and, and courageous from other perspectives. Uh, so just, just to put that on the table as well. Right, thank you. Um, okay, let's go for a final question. And please, uh, let's uh, answer this briefly. Um, so there is a question by Louis about, um, he asks, uh, do you believe the type of challenges you identify for implementing shock response social protection uh, uh, are, similar to the, uh, are similar for developed countries as for uh, countries in, in development? Uh, so basically, capacities and resources are certainly higher in high income level countries, but how come that they didn't use these mechanisms that much? No? So he asks if this lack of flexibility lack of knowledge, I would add lack of uh, leadership, no? So basically to what extent uh, this differs from um, 
lower income countries and higher income countries, no? and how that affects the, the response. Um, anyone who wants to answer this question? It's a tough one, and Rodolfo, you might want to come in. But one thing, um, obviously, we've all been mainly fun following uh, low and middle income countries. But I've sort of almost as a, a personal obsession of mine, apart from following my own country, I've also been following the, the, the US, the UK, the, the J Japan, Malaysia, sort of a few. And I feel like actually a, a lot of the challenges that we've been discussing today have actually been the same challenges that have been faced there. From the, the system continuity and resilience perspective, we saw kind of massive crashes in systems because they couldn't cope with the, the kind of sudden surge in, in demand. They did have kind of in many cases on demand systems, but these weren't ready to cope with that type of surge from 200,000 applicants to 6 million applicants just in, the, in two weeks for, for US unemployment, just as one example. Um, they faced kind of the, the similar issues of trying to come up with piecemeal approaches to new programs that were extending to unserved populations. And they were doing that often in a non-inclusive way. Again, we've talked a lot about this US uh, grant that went to all people, but it was extremely badly targeted from many perspectives. It, it used tax data. It was going to those who had filed a tax uh, return in the previous year. The people who received it, the, the, the slowest, the latest, sometimes they didn't receive it at all, were actually the ones who were worse off. We saw kind of I think 37% of SNAP beneficiaries, so routine social assistance beneficiaries, have not received this, this money coming from the, the relief response in, in the US. Um, so a, a lot of these challenges and things we've been discussing, obviously they, they've been slightly different in high income countries, but the, the countries that I've been following have faced very much similar issues and they've actually adapted their programs in similar ways and, and it, they were caught just as unprepared as, as many low middle income countries. I, I don't know if others want to add to those reactions. With obviously the, the big exception being the, the much bigger role played by social insurance and, and labor market policies. So the, the role that uh, existing programs that are designed to be flexible to respond to this kind of economic crisis as wage subsidies and uh, have been kind of obviously that that is a major difference. Um, anyone, anyone else? Uh, well, I was I was gonna I was gonna highlight the issue of uh, social insurance. No, of course, I mean, countries with high coverage of uh, social insurance, uh, they have this automatic uh, response mechanism in place. No, but my I mean, this is a very interesting question. I would take a lot of time to, to discuss it. But of course, I mean, uh, having stronger social protection systems and enabling environment. We talk about uh, um, financial inclusion, uh, access to internet, and so on. All that uh, it provides a better platform to respond. No, but on the other hand, there are things that are common to all countries. No, like for example, the the, the lack of planning or, or flexibility in the system, uh, the leadership. No, some we saw some countries with some lower income countries with stronger and clearer leadership than others, no? So leadership, of course, matters a lot. Some countries just simply making the, the wrong policy choices, even with good intentions, no? So all these things, uh, of course, they affect the way you respond and they are common to, to, to all countries, no? Um, so we've run out of time. Uh, I apologize for, uh, apologize for that, but I think we have a really, really rich discussion in addition to uh, sharing the, the key insights from the, from the research. So um, thank you very much for, for joining this session. Uh, please take a moment to, to answer the survey that, that will appear on your, your browser after we close. Uh, and please uh, do uh, read our reports uh, and uh, we there are a few uh, questions that we couldn't answer, and we're going to answer them uh, tomorrow probably or the day after. Uh, and we are available for any any further discussions on these on these topics. Thank you very much for for joining, and thank you very much for for the discussions and, and, and the presenters uh, for the insights. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. bye.